even Busta Rhymes, like, I was fascinated with his cadence drops. You know, that pitter patter, you chitter chatter too much. I'm a splitter splatter, your blitter bladder make you spill out your guts. Like, what? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you know, like. my favorite artists about who or what they would recommend me checking out. Make sure to subscribe to our channel or hit the like button. Leron Thomas, aka Pan Amsterdam, is an American jazz trumpeter, composer, and vocalist noted for his musical style as a masterful genre bender. Born in Houston, Texas, Thomas attended the high school for the performing and visual arts. The trumpet was Thomas' main instrument and his focus was composing jazz. As reported in an Australian radio interview, he became frustrated with the contemporary scene and began creating other music, seemingly as a hard left turn. Another significant element of Thomas' style is his humor, and sometimes he leaves his listener not knowing when he is joking. Thomas is known as a serious improviser, encompassing various styles of music, including straight ahead jazz, funk, singer-songwriter, R&B, indie rock, country, and rap. I spoke to Leron about Roy Hargrove, an American jazz musician and composer whose principal instruments were the trumpet and flugelhorn. He achieved worldwide acclaim after winning two Grammy Awards for jazz in 98 and 2002. Hargrove primarily played in the hard bop style for the majority of his albums, but also had a penchant for genre-crossing exploration and collaboration with a variety of hip-hop, soul, R&B, alternative rock artists. As Hargrove told one reporter, I've been around all kinds of musicians, and if a cat can play, a cat can play. If it's gospel, funk, R&B, jazz, or hip-hop, if it's something that gets in the ear and it's good, that's what matters. If you're into my illustrations, please check out my illustration book, Accolades, which you can still get on greatrecords.be. This is what Leron had to add. Well, I want to give accolades to Roy Hargrove. Roy Hargrove is uh, one of the biggest influences for me musically and artistically and, you know, philosophically. I love Roy, man. He just passed a few years ago. You know, like, you know how you go on the internet and you see everybody do their eulogies? It almost seems like people just want to get likes. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, I, I didn't really want to do that, man. So, you know, this is kind of my uh, hat tip to him. I wanted to make it somewhat public. Roy Hargrove was a jazz trumpeter, great composer. He actually came outside of Dallas, Texas, around Waco area. He went to a performing arts school in Dallas. Uh, and he went there with like, Erica Badu was one of his classmates. You can find him deep in the hip hop world. I know he did stuff for Common, he did stuff for D'Angelo. He did stuff for a lot of people, quietly. But he was very much a jazz musician and a great, a great, great trumpet sound. I mean, as far as one of the most innovative trumpet players, I think, in my lifetime, for sure. He was pretty young when he died? Yeah, he was young when he died. I mean, I think he was probably in his 50s or something like that, early 50s, if even. He had his rock star period, but I don't think that's what took him out, uh, you know. <laughs> I mean, what musician of any stature doesn't have a bit of rock star in them, <laughs> you know. Is that what he's known for, for doing records for other people, or is he known for his own stuff as well? He's known for his own work. He's okay. known for his own work. He got discovered at a very early age, and then people like Bobby Watson took him under his wing, and uh, these are jazz legends, elders, and things of that nature. I know he's playing with Betty Carter. He was playing with a lot of people. And then uh, he started doing his own records, and they were part of what they call in the jazz world the Young Lion era. Uh, era? Era? Ever. That was funny. Yeah. The young is still early in the morning for me, man. But yeah, the young lion era. And uh yeah. Nah, he he was a badass man. And I remember I wanted to sound like him, you know. I would always try and copy his solos, you know, transcribe his solos and whatnot. To the point where, you know, I'm from Houston, Texas originally. I was like checking him out in the midst of checking out like ghetto boys. <laughs> you know what I mean? Crazy. And all that kind of stuff, you yeah. know. But I remember just trying to sound like him all the time. And there were a lot of people that I actually went to school with and people older than me that were in the school earlier. I know Eric Harlan and them started saying that, that people around the city were calling me Little Roy. You know, Roy was actually a little dude. I'm a kind of a big guy. 
So I guess Little Big Roy would have probably been the, the better one. Yeah, no, nah, man, I, I remember trying to copy him and copy him. And then one day we went to Dallas. We went to a magnet school. So our magnet school in Houston went to the one in Dallas. Now, I don't know if you remember those Michael Jackson commercials. You know, where like a kid would be dancing like Michael Jackson and he turn around and it's Michael Jackson. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, that actually happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> but we got, you know, we got to the school and everything and I'm looking at all of these pictures of, you know, Roy and his band director's office, you know. I'm like, wow, man, he's a little dude, you know, because I had never really met him. And so then I was playing and I was playing and I was playing uh, at the jam session at the school. And then somebody tapped my shoulder, and it was my friend Walter Smith the third. Kind of did his head like, "Look behind you more," you know. So I look back, and it's Roy. He happened to be in town, you know. And he's visiting his old school, and he whips out his horn, starts playing all of my licks because they were his licks. <laughs> you know? And then, uh, yeah, man, I, I was I was shocked. I was really shocked. And then he started playing some other stuff I had never heard him play before playing higher notes than I had ever heard him play before. For a jazz musician, it tells you a lot about hearing them on a uh, on an album, on a recording, and then hearing them live. It's a whole nother get up, especially at a jam session. And uh, that was just amazing, an amazing experience. I knew I was going to New York after that, you know? <laughs> yeah. And did he, uh, um, like you, you said, he, he inspired you, but uh, like, are you mainly working on hip hop stuff? Well, I mean, I started off as a jazz musician. Uh, I was a jazz trumpeter. I never would have thought that I would have got into vocals of any sort. It's the opposite of like what people would normally expect, like uh, I would think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> Repetitive music kind of is easier to focus on and and is recognizable for like I think a younger brain or whatever. I don't know. I don't know. I'd say it differently than that. You, you did. You did the opposite move. Yeah, I was more interested in uh, improvisational music. You know what I mean. Uh, you know, I mean, like for me, improvisation is something that, uh, at least in my culture where I come from, is a big deal in any uh, form or fashion. I mean, it would always be funny if you sit around in the house and everybody's making up some lyrics to something else, you know. There's something on the radio, but they're making up lyrics on top of that, and expounding upon that. I like that. I mean, that's kind of what I was into. And I think naturally, when I heard jazz for the first time, it, to me, it sounded like instruments talking to themselves. Mm -hmm. like this big conversation. So I wanted to get in on the conversation. I knew there was a language there. I just didn't understand it. You fast forward to hip hop. Hip hop does the same thing. I mean, it's off, you know, that whole, it's how you got your rap battles off the dome and all that kind of business, you know? Personally, as a Pan Am, I'm not good at that. You know, I'm more of a, a jazz musician. If you want me to go off the dome on the horn, well, then let's go. You know what I mean? But as far as, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. I think it but, doesn't, yeah, I mean, doesn't, doesn't have a lot to do with how old you are when you start writing. I think the younger you are, the more of a genius you are. It's like when, when you see with skateboarders, like when we were 15, 16, we could mm. hardly do an ollie or like grind on something. And you got these five-year-old kids that do it without like even thinking about it. It's very impulse-based, I think. And I think that has probably something to do with freestyling as well, right? For sure, for sure. The younger you are, the closer you are to your genius, usually. There's theories out there. Like, you've ever heard of the Suzuki method? Like, well, this is Japanese guy, something, something, Suzuki. They basically came up with this whole idea that kids, if you give them a bunch of information at an early age, they can actually retain that information more so than an adult can. So he would give them hard classical pieces and whatnot. And you would have like, you know, these young kids playing Tchaikovsky and, uh, you know, Scriabin and all that kind of business, you know, and, and at a very young age. And uh, the theory proved to be correct. So for me, I think that's what it was. I was just kind of hungry for retaining uh, as much uh, improvisational aspects of, of the art as I could. Are you classically trumpet trained? Yeah, I am actually. It's funny because I actually deal with other trumpet players that are getting into their classical period now. They were they started off more as uh, improvisational players, mm -hmm. and uh, you know I'm trying to stray away from that word jazz because it's it's kind of under scrutiny right now. <laughs> so I'll say improvisational players, you know. But uh, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, a great, great, great uh, improvisational players that got into classical later. And it's, it's interesting watching them do that. One of my friends, uh, Jonathan Finlayson, is actually getting off into the classical repertoire a lot. Shout out to Jonathan, actually. You know, and um, it's, it's interesting going through those A2s with him uh, the other day. 
and just you know going through that stuff is it's fun yeah i was definitely classically trained so to speak you grew up in houston you said right yeah yeah you, know, like, in the H. you must have had houston rap around you was that like an inspiration it totally was because i mean back in the day me and this other trumpet player keon harrell we used to uh do trumpet battles over the phone he was from like st louis and uh, at that time cash money was just coming out and also you had no limit was was out there you know, with Master P's label. And so like, you know, a lot of times we were improving and stuff, we would try to phrase like, let's say Silk the Shocker or somebody. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We would try to incorporate that. The rap cadences or like the melodies? The cadences, yeah. the cadences, man. Even Busta Rhymes, like, I was fascinated with his cadence drops. You know, that pitter patter, you chitter chatter too much. I'm a splitter spider, your blitter bladder make you spill out your guts. Like, what? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you know, like, <laughs> and I mean, I would listen to that, man. And I, you know, you want to get on the horn, you know, like you, you want to, you want to be able to do that. Yeah, man. I mean, definitely. Uh, like I said, me and my friend Keon Harrell would do trumpet battles doing that kind of thing. And then also there'd be like, you know, of course, Ghetto Boys came out like when My Mind's Playing Tricks on Me came out. That like killed Houston. Everybody was listening to that. And then I remember when Juvenile, like when Cash Money first came out, you know, Houston really didn't give them love like that. And I remember we went to go see Juvenile at this club called Club Oasis back in Houston in the day. That was a dope ass club, man. Mm -hmm. And it was like, so, you know, Juvenile sitting there rapping to a backing track, you know, the sound quality isn't so good and on the stage. And, you know, it was just kind of boring. You know what I mean? I remember that. And then all of a sudden, you know, you heard that. You know, that the, the song came out and it was, you know, and it's all them cast. You know, you were paper chasing, you got your block on fire, remain the G to the moment you aspire. You know what it is to make nothing out of something. You handle your biz and don't be crying and you're suffering. Like you heard, you like, whoa, and then that's Juvie. You know, my best friend, Brandon Carter, he was actually listening to, I remember Wu Tang at one time, you know, because mm -hmm. we were from the South, so I couldn't really relate to Wu Tang like that. You know what I'm saying? I was listening to it. And I was like, man, these cats, you know, we need a hook. Kind of in the South, we need a strong yeah. hook. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, man, we got DJ Screw out here. You know what I'm saying? And I'm just listening to all this stuff. And I'm like, I can't really feel it, but I can feel the Southern stuff. We just hit things different. And then bling, like you said, bling culture came out. And that whole thing about flossing on how you look. I mean, that's something that in the South, that just come from the church to me, man. You know, in the church, you gotta look good, man. You know, you gotta have the nice Stacey Adams shoes, you know what I'm saying? You gotta have your stuff laced up nice, you know? Well, it was hustle culture. I mean, what it is, is basically, I mean, and these cats was coming from hoods. That's a big difference that I couldn't really, from the first moment, get whatever was going on because those worlds are so different, you know? People are different. I mean, some people was representing the hood on how tough it was and whatnot, and they were making money that way. These cats was basically making money already from the hood and showing that lifestyle. Jay-Z was pretty much on that, too. They were like, look, man, I actually make money from the streets. You know, you got to hear you got to hear the drug dealers, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you got to hear his understanding on the matter. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The drug dealers and the pimps and whatnot, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and uh, these cats wanted to to make, make things look ghetto fabulous. You know, they didn't want to dress down, they wanted to dress up. And I can understand where people are coming from because I mean, let's look at the end result of it all. You know, that blending culture and everything is good for Wall Street. I mean, Wall Street boys basically seal their deals or whatever, you know, ripping off the public and whatever with their hedge funds or whatever. And they're, you know, they're banging Jay-Z or Master P or whatever, kind of ghetto fabulous music they can get their hands on. You know what I mean? And it's kind of a soundtrack and they and they kind of complement each other this kind of uh capitalistic culture that's out there and uh whether that's you know a good thing or a bad thing uh, i can't judge it i mean i can understand it i don't like you know aspects of it for me i just kind of like to focus on more of the music side of things but you can't do it without looking at the, the psyche behind the social conditions and whatnot that's going on around. I mean, I, I have to look at all those things and I try not to judge too much, but at the same time, of course you're gonna judge somewhat. You're a human being, you know what I mean? I think that's how I came up with the Pan Am character. Like, just tried to look for something in between. 
that. You know what I'm saying? And not try and lean this way or lean this way too much or anything like that. You know what I'm saying? Back to Roy Hargrove, like when yeah. I heard that in improvisational music. What I liked about Roy, man, Roy would dress in hip hop culture, but the guy was playing music that had history from like the earlier 20th century and, and, and earlier. It's crazy, you know, to have that kind of understanding and still live in the times. I mean, Roy was a fantastic dresser. I mean, even up to his death, man, that cat was always wearing the latest. You know, like, you know, the ladies liked Roy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? How do you got to know of his music? Do you remember that? You know, as a kid, what do you do? You look at the CD cover, you look at the album cover, yes. right? So, you know, I was in the jazz section and I saw this cat. You know, remember those big box CD covers, those big uh, rectangular CD covers? Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you know, and I'm, I'm over here and I'm looking at this dude and he's wearing cross colors. Then I look at the back and it looks like he's wearing some Tim's. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. Yo, who was this trumpet player? You know, and he looked around my age. I said, I got to buy this album. The album was called The Vibe. And I put the album on, and it's straight up, just authentic improvisational music, you know, from, from the history of the music. Is there a technical way of explaining why your style sounds a lot like his when it comes to improvisation? I mean, my style is totally different. I mean, I went all over the place. As far as him, he's stuck to traditional aspects. In other words, you can see the lineage of Blue Mitchell, Uh, Lee Morgan, Freddie Hubbard, uh, you can hear uh, a lot of people, man, uh, in Roy's plan. KD, Kenny Dorham, you can definitely hear Kenny Dorham. You can hear uh, Clifford Brown, you know, you can hear Bird, you know, Charlie Parker. Mm -hmm. uh, you can hear all of that. You can hear Miles in his playing. You can hear a direct lineage in his playing, in his approach to the music, and also an ensemble. He stood out to me because his sound, at first it's the fashion. You know, when you're a kid, you're like, you know, you're like, wow, this cat's wearing hip hop gear. Let me see what that's about. But what he did was, is with that hip hop gear, he drew us into more education about ourselves. I mean, a lot of times, see, you got to understand in the black community, we don't usually get to know our history as well as, let's say, other people get to know our history because we always got to be on the hustle. So let's say Jay-Z wouldn't know much about Charlie Parker. He might know it now because he's got some money on him, he's got cultured a bit. But when he was in the streets, I don't know if he knew about Bird like that. And then, and, and that also happens systematically, uh, you know, with the social conditionings by what the government and everything's doing. I mean, like, look, when they took the instruments out of black schools, the music changed. You know, Cass was left literally with two turntables and a microphone. So the dexterity is still there. And that improvisational quality is still there. There's still a connection. Cats don't really get to know that history that well. They, they, they can't relate to their grandmother or their uncle across town. They, or they could be in the same hood and can't relate. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What happens is, is you get somebody like a Roy Hargrove dressing in that gear of today and keeping that legacy of the music. That's pretty genius to me. You know what I mean? Most cats that were playing that music back then were kind of uppity looking, you know, like I ain't gonna name names, but they looked really yuppy. They were trying to put the music basically on the white man's table, like you should accept this as a part of culture in America. You know what I mean? And that was necessary too. Mm -hmm. That was definitely necessary. I'm not gonna say it's not, but that just wasn't attractive to me at the time. And then once you started to learn the history more, you started to get, you know, from, from watching this, you like trying to understand what the, the music is that he's playing. And then you realize there's a lot of math and theory behind that. There's a lot of brain power you have to have. And then at the same time, be very soulful. Combine these two in a certain type of harmony that uh, doesn't sound forced or anything. It sounds natural to the point where the common ear is attracted to it. That's the real test, <laughs> you know. And so I started learning that from Roy. I was listening to his sound. And the one thing I, that stuck out to me is Roy had an impeccable way of playing ballads, his ballad playing. That's the one thing that I wanted to get into because every everybody I liked had a slow jam. I had a conversation with DJ D Styles the other day and he named Bill Evans and his reason for naming Bill Evans is because his slow approach of like playing piano and especially how his ballads stood out to him. Yeah, I mean, I love, yeah. I, and I love Bill Evans, by the way. I like, I actually played my daughter so she can take naps. I played Waltz for Debbie. <laughs> yeah, I don't tell her what that's about, though. I think Debbie was a girlfriend that killed herself. There's no words to it, so it's not like she can... Uh... <laughs> yeah, 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 you know. We'll tell you that down the line. <laughs> yeah. But it would be, what is your favorite song of his? 
And second part would be, what is the most representable song for somebody that hasn't really listened to him at all to like kind of get to know his style or is that the same song? That's a hard one, huh? Cause I like so many songs by Roy. One of the more, the most haunting ballads I've ever heard him play that really just does it for me consistently. There are a few of them, but the one where he's just playing, it's just a bass and a trumpet and it's called Ethiopia. That's a really beautiful piece. He, I don't know if he wrote that. He didn't write that, I don't think. But uh, that's a badass piece. And his his interpretation of that piece is out of this world, you know? The dude is bad, man. And then as far as if people want to get into Roy, there's this one song called Strasbourg that uh, people like that he did. I like it, too. It's cute. You know what I mean? I, you know, it's just a good start, I guess. As far as album-wise, probably the RH Factor album called Air Food because he has... Uh, Rene Newfinville, uh, he has a Q-tip from Tribe Called Quest on it. He kind of shows his culture, like, you know, his, his peers and his contemporaries. Puts his improvisational code on the shelf for a minute. I want to thank Leron for this conversation. On next week's episode, I'm talking to Duke Fakir from the legendary Four Tops about his love for the music of The Temptations. Thanks for listening, watching, or however you check out accolades. Give us a thumbs up or follow us on our channel. See you next week.